welcome to Ship, Sea and the Stars, our weekly online webcast from Royal Museums Greenwich. We're here every week with stories of history and creativity and culture and all kinds of exciting things with the fabulous curators from Royal Museums Greenwich and special guests. As ever, if you want to get in touch with us, please do find us on Facebook, Instagram or Twitter. Just search for Royal Museums Greenwich. We'd love to hear from you about topics you think we should cover or questions that you've got that are raised by this week's episode. And this week's episode is all about shipwrecks. 35 years ago this week, the wreck of the SS Titanic was found. Um, so she'd been at the bottom of the North Atlantic Ocean, she's still there, for 70 years. Uh, and she was finally located by a joint expedition, French and American expedition. And there's, you know, there's no doubt she is one of the most, if not the most famous wreck in maritime history. But she's not the only one. Every year, marine archaeologists are discovering all kinds of exciting things in the deep. And so we're going to be talking about all of that this week with our two fabulous guests. Um, and the first one is Andrew Chung, who is the Curator of Historic Photographs and Ship Plans at Royal Museums Greenwich. And the second is Helen Farr, who's a marine archaeologist at the University of Southampton. So just um, a sentence from each of you, just on your connection to this topic. Andrew, should we start with you? Uh, yes, well, I, um, I, I had a, a, quite a deep interest in the Titanic because, of course, I was in primary school when the wreck was found. And that the, the Christmas of the next year, my parents bought me um, Ballard's brand new book about the discovery of the Titanic. And I was hooked uh, for years. And, and even now, the, my, my interests have moved on slightly onto naval matters. But Titanic still exercises this magic for me, as she does for so many other people. Is a brilliant starter story is how to get to be a curator. Um, Helen, how about you? Yeah, I'm really interested in maritime archaeology more generally from the very earliest periods of seafaring and human oceans, but also when it comes to these big classic shipwrecks. It's for me that the fascination is about how we preserve them and it's about the underwater cultural heritage and the nature of that heritage. Brilliant, thank you. Well, we are going to start with the Titanic. She was a modern passenger liner at the time. She was 269 metres long, which is pretty big even now. Uh, of course, she struck an iceberg on her maiden voyage in 1912 and sunk in just under three hours. And to get us started today, we're going to hear a passage that was written by Lawrence Beasley. He was a science teacher who survived the disaster, went on to write a book about it. And this is just it's a stunning reading so at this point he has escaped from the ship he's on one of the lifeboats and he's looking back at the titanic for the last moments that she is above water and it's read by simon kane we gazed broadside on the titanic from a short distance she was absolutely still indeed from the first it seemed as if the blow from the iceberg had taken all the courage out of her and she had just come quietly to rest and was settling down without an effort to save herself, without a murmur of protest against such a foul blow. For the sea could not rock her. The wind was not there to howl noisily round the decks and make the ropes hum. From the first, what must have impressed all as they watched was the sense of stillness about her, and the slow, insensible way she sank lower and lower in the sea, like a stricken animal. Imagine a ship nearly a sixth of a mile long, 75 feet high to the top decks and mast again as high above the funnels, with a hundreds of portholes, all her saloons and other rooms brilliant with light, and all around her little boats filled with those who until a few hours before had trod her decks and read in her libraries and listened to the music of her band in happy content, and who were now looking up in amazement at the enormous mass above them and rowing away from her because she was sinking. The sea level and the rows of lights should have been parallel, should never have met. And now they met at an angle inside the black hull of the ship. There was nothing else to indicate she was injured, nothing but this apparent violation of a simple geometrical law that parallel lines should never meet, even if produced ever so far both ways. But it meant the Titanic had sunk by the head until the lowest portals in the bows were under the sea, and the lowest portals in the stern were lifted above the normal height. We rode away from her in the quietness of the night, hoping and praying with all our hearts that she would sink no more and the day would find her still in the same position as she was then. As we watched, the Titanic sank lower and lower by the head and the angle became wider and wider as the stern porthole lights lifted and the bow lights sank and it was evident she was not to stay afloat much longer. At about 2.15am, 
The water had crept up almost to her side light and the captain's bridge, and it seemed a question only of minutes before she sank. The oarsmen lay on their oars, and all in the lifeboat were motionless as we watched her in absolute silence, save some who would not look and bury their heads on each other's shoulders. The lights still shone with the same brilliance, but not so many of them. Many were now below the surface. And then, as we gazed awestruck, she tilted slowly up, revolving apparently about a centre of gravity just astern of a midships, until she attained a virtually upright position, and there she remained, motionless. As she swung up, her lights, which had shone without a flicker all night, went out suddenly, came on again for a single flash, and then went out altogether. And as they did so, there came a noise, partly a roar, partly a groan, partly a rattle, and partly a smash. It went on successively for some seconds, possibly fifteen to twenty, as the heavy machinery dropped down to the bottom, now the bows, of the ship. When the noise was over, the Titanic was still upright like a column. We could see her now only as the stern and some 150 feet of her stood outlined against the star-specked sky, looming black in the darkness, and in this position she continued for some minutes, I think as much as five minutes, but it may have been less. Then, first sinking back a little at the stern, I thought, she slid slowly through the water and dived slantingly down. The sea closed over her, and we had seen the last of the beautiful ship on which we had embarked four days before at Southampton. We waited for the wave which we thought might come, but although the Titanic left us no such legacy of a wave as she went to the bottom, she left us something we would willingly forget forever, something which it is well not to let the imagination dwell on, the cries of many hundreds of our fellow passengers struggling in the ice-cold water. We longed to return and rescue at least some of the drowning, but we knew it was impossible. The boat was filled to standing room, and to return would mean the swamping of us all, and so the Captain Stoker told his crew to row away from all the cries. We tried to sing, to keep all from thinking of them, but there was no heart for singing in the boat at that time. The cries, which were loud and numerous at first, died away gradually, one by one, but the night was clear, frosty and still, the water smooth, and the sounds must have carried on its level surface, free from any obstruction, for miles, certainly much farther from the ship than we were situated, I think the last of them must have been heard nearly forty minutes after the Titanic sank. Life belts would keep the survivors afloat for hours, but the cold water was what stopped the cries. So it's that the reading it's 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 a really good place to start, I think, because first of all it's a reminder of the tragedy. Like when a ship goes down, it's almost never for a good reason. Uh, and the other thing is that you really get the sense from that that this is burned on his brain you know even though he wrote these words quite soon afterwards you really get the sense that he he's living this again um what what did you take away from this andrew perhaps we'll start with you well i i've always been impressed by um beasley's book and his writings um i am amazed in part at how clinical he sounds in his description it's a very in, in it's a blend of this very level-headed observation and yet you can also feel the terrible emotions that are going through him as he sees the ship go and what really gets me is the bit at the end where he does break out of his shell a bit and dwell on the human tragedy that's unfolding around him that that last bit about how the cries are gradually silenced and and he specifically says you know this thing we would rather nev never never have experience or we would like to forget. Um, very, very powerful stuff. Yeah, how about you, Helen? Yeah, uh, it really brings the human tragedy into focus, doesn't it, to have that narrative. And for the shipwrecks that I look at, and I've been lucky enough, I guess, to work on, it's so easy to forget that human story of the sinking and of the human loss when you come and you, you find the shipwreck through survey or diving and you get that friction of excitement that you found the thing that you're looking for, but it's always underlaid with that poignancy that the people on board are unlikely to have survived or few people were as likely to have got away, especially with these small earlier shipwrecks. And obviously as well, 
here and I mean I'm sat in the city of Southampton today and it was very much a loss for the the whole city of Southampton because of the number of crew involved and their involvement in Titanic streets and streets down here where members of families were lost the whole city was in mourning yeah and it's, it's a, as you say it's a reminder that it's not just about the impacts at sea but the impacts back in the community they came from or were going to okay well let's let's move on to the uh, some of the things that you can find underwater and helen you've got our first object which is the oldest thing we're going to look at today so you've got some obsidian show us that yes so this this is going back a different era i guess and, and I've got some here, thinking about what I could show you from home. So first of all, I'll show you and then I'll talk to you a bit about it. So beautiful, glassy, black, lustrous. So I wanted to say something a little bit about early seafaring because it's something that I'm really interested um, in specifically. And it also sets the context nicely. Uh, so I wanted to go right back in time. And so that's why I'm starting a chat about shipwrecks with some rock, basically, which seems a little strange. But um, so how far back can we go? Well, the answer to that is if we talk about seafaring, we can go seriously a long way back in the human story. So we can talk about hominin seagoing. I say seagoing perhaps instead of seafaring, but maybe 800,000 years ago we have evidence of hominins moving across the islands, for example. What, yeah. sort of, what sort of evidence can you have from 800,000 years well, ago? Exactly. So I have to say here that the earliest boat we have is about 8,000 years old, which is old, but not that old. And that's a log boat from a place called Pesse in the Netherlands. We don't really have um, uncontested early seafaring I guess, until around 65 to 50,000 years ago. And that's deep time. And for that, we see actually quite large crossings of between 25 to 30 kilometers up to about 100 kilometers made by our direct ancestors, Homo sapiens sapiens, who arrived in Australia, that would have been Australasia really, Australia and New Guinea, because they were connected at that time. So that's really going back into deep time. But if I bring it back to the obsidian, the earliest evidence we have that's uncontested in the Mediterranean comes from this. And this is um, the obsidian, which comes from the island of Milos, and it was found in Frank T. Cave, and that's about 12,000 years ago. So that's still a really long history of seafaring. And by Around 5,000 years ago, you have actually really quite complex trade routes already created. And these trade routes that are moving around from island sources where you have this obsidian that's found, we suddenly find obsidian then on lots and lots of Neolithic sites across the Mediterranean. So it's not something that you're finding underwater, but you, you know it started in one place and it ended up somewhere else across the sea. Exactly. And so it must have got there across the sea. Yes. And the reason we know that is because obsidian is a volcanic glass. So you can see it's glassy. Uh, for the people who like geology, I'm going to hold it up. It's, um, it's a rhyolitic igneous, uh, igneous obviously, because it comes from volcanoes. And it was a slow moving viscous lava. And when it cools, it's been super cooled very fast. And when it cools, you don't have time for the, the crystals to form. So you get to lovely glass. And that glass means that when it breaks or shatters, you get, it's called a conchoidal fracture. So can you see with the light? Curved lines, isn't it? So curved, almost look like they belong to a circle, but they're all kind of, it's yeah. like, the, like an old record. A vinyl records. Exactly. <laughs> Those kind of lines. Exactly. And that's the energy traveling through it. And because of that conchoidal fracture, it means it was really sharp and good to be used as a stone tool. And I've got a box here. And if I take one out and show you, here's a lovely blade. So it has long, very sharp edges. Now, the thing with obsidian is that they always say you, you see the blood before you feel the cut. 
So <laughs> I'm risking my fingers right now. But <laughs> it, it's really sharp. The edges can go down to just one single molecule thick, which means a bit like a modern surgical scalpel, it's really good for cutting. And it's really interesting because this is a time in the Neolithic where you see the first agriculture, the first villages, you see a new way of life. And everyone thinks that people start settling on the land. It's all about identity and land. But actually, for me, this obsidian shows that those maritime connections are still really important. And um, discovering the landscape and the seascape and using boats is very much a part of Neolithic life as much as that terrestrial agriculture and things that are happening at that time. So it's a really key moment in our development. So it's really interesting that our first um, marine archaeology artifact is actually something you find on land, but that is a good place to start the story. So we're going to move forward in time a little bit now to 1870 and to the sort of shipwreck that perhaps we're, we've heard a bit more about. So Andrew, tell us about the HMS Captain. Well, HMS Captain is probably one of the unluckiest warships uh, ever to have been built. Um, she was created uh, in the centre of a whirlwind of controversy. Um, there were lots of different strands of development and uncertainty behind her design and creation. There's a lot of very, I'll say, challenging and interesting personalities involved behind her creation. Um, one name that is linked to her forever is that of Captain Calcutt, who was a very eccentric Royal Navy officer. Um, best to describe him as a bit of a flawed genius. Um, his claim to fame is he designed turrets was very, very good at designing turrets. He believed that these were the way forward for the Royal Navy. He, in his lifetime, if he could, he would have got rid of broadside warships, he would have got rid of central battery ships. It was, it was the turret's way or the highway. So we're and talking he, about the thing that if you're gonna fire artillery at somebody, this is the place where you put your cannon or your That's right. Your gun yes. So in order to point it in lots of different directions. With, uh, yeah, revolving citadel with guns in it. And the advantage of this thing is you can concentrate your guns in one place. You can armor it extremely heavily and not worry about other parts of the ship. So he gets given he, the enthusiasm for turrets and new technology. He he is then allowed to design a ship. This ship was eventually constructed, great public acclaim, but she had a lot of hidden flaws which were not immediately obvious. There are some quite unhidden flaws in that ship, though. If you look at it, like the freeboard on that, you know, it, if you, it looks like if a small wave came along, you would swamp it straight away. That's thing number one, isn't it? Um, and then it just looks like, it just looks unmanoeuvrable and very ungainly. <laughs> Yes, well, well, startlingly enough, the low freeboard was actually not the most dangerous aspect. You're right, it is the most obvious problem with her, and no other British battleship before or since has had such a low freeboard for very good reasons. Um, but what really killed her was, if you look at the, um, I'll call it a flying bridge linking the forecastle and the poop, uh, and it runs directly above the turrets, um, what so we're talking one... about the kind of second layer here, the, the, yeah. the mid bit almost. Um... Yes, the, high, the highest deck uh, um, on the ship. Now, Coles built that in for a reason. Um, he was very critical of an earlier Admiralty effort at a turret, Monarch. And his problem with Monarch was there was an awful lot of rigging in the way. She had hinged bulwarks, um, which could be dropped in order to allow her to fight, but otherwise in, in heavy weather, the bulwarks would be raised to give her a bit more freeboard. Really sensible idea. Colt hated it because it impaired her efficiency. Um, so his idea was that the rigging could be completely worked from that flying bridge there. There'd be no, there'd be no shrouds, there'd be, there wouldn't be any running rigging in the way of the gun. She could steam or sail up to someone and fight them immediately. Um, but in order to overcome the problems of fitting a full ship rig onto that extremely narrow deck, he did away with traditional wooden masts and he substituted his own design of iron tripod masts. If you imagine the exponential increase in weight uh, and, and the consequent effect on the ship's stability of that arrangement. So, so we've got this top-heavy ship with a with a a very, very little splash protection and two great big turrets in the middle. Yeah. How long did she last before she keeled over? 
Um, not long at all, uh, I'm afraid. She, uh, if we're thinking in terms of her voyage um, with the rest of the fleet on Cape Finisterre, she literally did not last the night. Um, what's very telling is that a lot of the older ships, aside from the few that lost some yards and, and bits of sail in heavy weather, did not log the storm as anything exceptional. It just shows how vulnerable <laughs> Captain was to this peculiar set of circumstances. Uh, but even then, she need not have met the fate that overtook her, but she was, she'd laid on an awful lot of sail. And the part of the controversy behind her loss was the question of whether the captain had been properly briefed as to the property of his brand new ship. Um, because the, the sail area that she had on when the wind overtook her was one problem. The other one was because her crew were unfamiliar with trying to work a full ship rig from this very narrow flying deck. They were all used to be mere ships or elbow room. They simply couldn't reef their sails fast enough. She went so quickly. They couldn't there was take no... the sails in to yeah, yeah, reduce was... the push from the wind. Yeah, so there was no time to take that sort of remedial action. Well, let's let's just let's move on to the idea of you know we we've we've seen the ones that sunk. There's this difficult issue. There's all these fascinating stories if you can get to the shipwreck, um, and this is a, a question really for both of you. Maybe we'll start with Helen, which is that there are massive ethical concerns with doing this. You can't just you know. Uh, take your little sailing boat go out to sea and start diving on a wreck like what what are the ethical difficulties with doing some of this um, maritime archaeology Helen? Yeah so it's really important to remember that this is cultural heritage these are cultural heritage sites uh, many of them are important historically or culturally and many of them are also grave sites as well so they're memorials so that has to be taken into account. Now, the underwater, um, when it comes to underwater cultural heritage, the problem is that there's a lot of out of sight, out of mind type stuff that happens. So people who think that they can make a financial gain out of shipwrecks, for example, salvage companies, treasure hunters. Now, the problem with that is that sometimes there's so much destruction to these sites so much information is lost and that information belongs to us all that's that's important knowledge about the past and that who who can possibly own that knowledge about the past it's not there to be bought and sold so people should not be commercially exploiting these sites but because it's underwater, because it's difficult to police, because people don't necessarily know where these things are, because of the complexities of the laws of the sea and international waters, that's where we have these gray areas. But just because something isn't legal, uh, or sorry, put it the other way around, just because something is legal doesn't mean it's ethical. And I think this is the problem we have, that quite often, if these sites were on land of where people had died, which was so important historically, the public would be in uproar because of the destruction. And it's just because they can't see it that it goes on. So there's the 2001 UNESCO uh, Convention for the Protection of Underwater Cultural Heritage. And that says um, that heritage should not be commercially exploited. And it's as simple as that. It really you shouldn't touch it, you need to, it needs to be preserved, in, if possible, in situ, which is where we're going towards at the moment. So you don't raise stuff. If it's safe, if it's uh, stable, then it stays where it is. And you can find out a lot about it without having to excavate these days or without having to lift it. So you can still find a lot of information about it, they can still be studied, but you're not then destroying the site because actually there's always this balance because archaeology actually is a form of destruction. If you're excavating a site, you're basically destroying the site. So we want to conserve it so we have it there for the future. So that's the key thing. And Andrew, when you're, you're a curator for the museum um, on these topics, how, how do you make decisions about the ethics? I mean, do people sometimes bring things to the attention of the museum and you go, oh, we, we can't really take that because it wasn't collected ethically or we should take it because now we've got it, we should definitely preserve it. How, how, does, how do the ethics work on that for the museum? 
It's a very difficult question. Uh, um, and I mean, luckily for me, it's not, not one uh, um, that we deal with all that often. Um, because I mean, really, if people are, are being doing things properly, uh, anything that's brought up should be declared to the receiver of REC uh, as a first instance. Um, I've certainly never had anyone come, in, in my experience, uh, uh, come up and say, oh, I brought this up, do you want it? Um, I'm not so sure how I'd react, um, probably with a great deal of anger initially, but then I'd hold <laughs> it and be a bit more professional. Wag your finger uh, at them professionally. Yes, yes. Say, where did you get it? <laughs> the circumstances? Was everything documented? Was everything properly surveyed? Um, that, that, that's the sort of question you would be compelled to ask because provenance is important. I asked Twitter what the, the, what the things were that people would most like to find underwater. And I'm going to give you a quick whiz through and ask about one of them. Everyone is very, very excited about this. The Antikythera mechanism, that was mentioned. I think that's possibly one of my favourites. Um, and then the big ships, the Mary Rose, the excitement on discovering Erebus and Terra, which were ships that were lost on the search for the Northwest Passage and then found in the, just a few years ago. Um, but the one that really intrigued me, Helen, and just very, very briefly, it'd be great if you could explain what this is, is that Amy Strike said the aluberon wreck with its ostrich ostrich eggs and glass ingots what is going on there <laughs> okay so the aluberon is a really famous shipwreck because it's late bronze age so it's quite an early ship and um so late 14th century bc and it was found just off the little village town of Kash, which is in southern turkey so it's in the mediterranean in quite deep water, but diveable. So it's an incredible shipwreck because it was the first one which really shows us the extent of maritime merchant trade of that period. Because what we see is the cargo, which had all sorts of things from glass, from Egypt and oxide ingots that had the signature stamps so they could tell where they were from to ostrich eggs, as was mentioned. Um, it really has so much, uh, so many amphora, just so many different things. And what you could do is you could almost trace the route of the ship around the Mediterranean as it stopped here to pick up some wine and stopped there to pick up something else. And the cargoes were collected as it moved around. So you could see this huge trade network happening of the late Bronze Age, which really tied these places together. It's also really interesting as a ship because of the history of the discipline, because actually it was one of the first really well excavated uh, shipwreck sites. And I think there was a, a remarkable number of dives to survey it. And there's something like 22,000 dives, I think. Wow. So, That's yeah. Over how long? Yeah, exactly. And it was is. dives as well. So it was really quite a feat of maritime archeology. span and the information that came from it, it's still huge amounts of work that's being done, sourcing all the materials and just finding out about that cargo. It's an, it's an impressive point. Brilliant. So well done, Amy Strike, for mentioning that. OK, so we're going to move on to other shipwrecks uh, that you have a more personal collection to, Helen. So we're going to come back to you and your you these all these things. All of this is fabulous. Um, shipwrecks in the Black Sea. Go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, where to start? Um, <laughs> so is your object. How about starting with that? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to show you something, and I hope you can see because again, this is like working from the home. Uh, so this is a 3D printed shipwreck. So imagine you're if you're coming looking straight at it. This is looking straight down. So we're looking down as if we were looking from the surface down yeah. towards the sea floor. Yeah, that's it. And you can see a few marks and ripples in the printing. And if I turn it, you can slow, you can sort of hopefully see some of, it depends on the light, if the sun comes <laughs> out, see a bit more of the dynamics. So what we can see is a mast and you can see the side of the ship, it's lying on its side and the rudder there and the bow is in, in the segment to the front. Right. So I'm gonna say a little bit more about this in a minute. I'm gonna just pop it down for now. So I'll just tell you how we found it first, I'll keep you guessing. So I was lucky enough to be involved in a huge maritime archaeological project, one of the largest probably since the raising of the Mary Rose. And this is the Black Sea Maritime Archaeological Project that was funded by the Julianne Hans Rousing Trust. 
And the idea of it was actually to study the Black Sea Basin through time after the last ice age. And it was more about the marine environment and rising sea levels. But in order to do that, we collected about 6,000 square kilometers of uh, survey data about what was on the bottom of the Black Sea. And we also took, I think it was something like 90 different cores as well to see through that sediment. And as we did it, we came across shipwrecks and we found about 65 shipwrecks. And this is one of them, perhaps kind of the most famous one because it got a lot of the attention because it, it was called by the press the earliest, most intact shipwreck in the world. And that's because it's pretty intact. I mean, you can see it's got its mast up still. It definitely looks up. like a ship. Or it a looks like a ship. Yeah. And this is an ancient Greek, Greek ship, but we had to do a bit of work to get there. As, as we often do in archaeology, you always find the best thing on the last day. And after several years of survey, this was kind of it. Um, so we were surveying from a big research ship. Uh, we had picked up an anomaly, so something that looked like there was something on the seabed, at 2,021 metres beneath us. Now, that's not diveable, that's really pretty deep. And so you, what we were using was a combination of geophysical survey to, to image the seabed, but also remote operated vehicles or ROVs. And we were lucky to have two of them. One, a working class ROV, which is a big sturdy thing with lots of lights and robotic arms. And one, a really fast thing, which looked, I mean, it looked fantastic. It's the fastest ROV in the world and it, it was called the ROV Interceptor and <laughs> it, it's zoomed along the bottom connected to an umbilical and you fly it from inside your big comfy research vessel so you don't have to dive you don't have to go in the submarine and it has all the cameras and you can collect data that way so we went down to have a look and as the lights fell on the ship, if you imagine you're dropping through the water column, you see the cameras are picking up all the way around you. And there's just darkness and bits of sediment drift like snow coming through the darkness. And the lights were sort of pinned onto the bottom on the seabed. And as you come through, it slowly illuminates the ship underneath you. And we were thinking, is this going to be another Roman ship? or which is fantastic, or um, an Ottoman ship, what, what are we going to see? And as we dropped down, we could see it looked quite familiar. It definitely looked old. So we could see from the back, it has a side runner, rudder. So that's an indication that you're looking at something which is ancient. We could see as we moved along it, that you've got the planks, which have gently um, begun to collapse in. And then going towards the bow, you've got uh, the bow itself is under the sediment, so you can't quite see it. Um, but you can see there's a raised deck, which we think was probably just at the front there. And then a mast about 12 meters, about 12 meters tall. So this is quite a small ship. I think it was about 20 meters in, in length. So was it immediately obvious then that this was really something special? It wasn't another Roman or Ottoman ship? It, it was it was clearly something special. You definitely have that moment where you get tingling. You you know this is something which is really important, and it's amazing. Everyone just goes quiet because everyone is thinking, "Gosh!" And I think lots of people felt that they had seen something. We were talking, you know, what is it? What, what could it be? And a lot of people felt that they had seen something similar elsewhere. And as we flew over the ship, you could see that as well as the mast, it had these thwarts or rowing benches. So it was some sort of sailed galley. Um, the rudders are quite diagnostic. So we thought, well, we'll use the working class ROV to gently excavate and see what happens. And by doing that, we were able to see the end of the rudder. And what we noticed then was instead of the ones that we'd been seeing that were Roman, which was straight, we saw this sort of splaying shape coming out at the end. And that was particularly diagnostic because then suddenly people realised that this is 
potentially something else. And actually, it turned out that the, the thing that was triggering the alarm bells in our heads was that it looks exactly like the image on the siren vase in the British Museum. And that's this beautiful 5th century BC vase with uh, red and black. And you see this ship, uh, the same swooping up towards the stern with the side rudders. The mast position is again slightly forward. And of course, in the siren vase, you have Odysseus tied to the mast to avoid the sirens. Um, so here we have a possible date. So what we did is we took a few samples of the wood and we got it radiocarbon dated. And that was all absolutely with permission, of course, because that was so important. Um, and it came back as between 410 to 350 calibrated BC, which puts it late 5th century to mid 4th century BC. So we were looking at an ancient Greek uh, ship which matches really quite um, remarkably to that depicted on the siren bars. So it's a, lo um, it's a lovely link up that you, you, you recognize, I mean, something that is, has never been seen before in real life and yet everyone, to, to recognize it from, a, from yeah. a picture effectively is a lovely thing. I know, and this, I mean, just think about it, the ship looks still like a ship and it's the sort of thing that would be fam familiar to Aristotle. And that just blows your mind. That's incredible. And there's no reason why we wouldn't find earlier things as well. I'm, I'm sure that now it's going, to, it's going to be preserved and they're there. So I think Bronze Age ships, I think they're there. So it's just a case of finding them. What a great game of hide and seek that is. Uh, fabulous. We, we could carry on talking about that for a long time. We haven't got time to because we have to get back to Andrew and the last object, back to the Titanic, um, which of course was an interesting shipwreck just because it was documented both before and after. And I guess it's not that common, not that often in history that there's been such good documentation both before and after a wreck was discovered. Um, I was actually on a research ship, the, the RV Noor. I spent time doing research on the RV Noor and she was the ship that the Titanic was discovered from, that Bob Ballard and that collaboration were working from. Uh, and they show you, you know, where, where the sonar system was and how they tracked it. Uh, that was quite an old ship now. But anyway, so Andrew, you have have two things from the Titanic. Let's start with the positive story first, which I think is the whistle. Yes, that's right. Um, most when, when a lot of people think of Titanic, unsurprisingly, they think big. Um, and when they think of Titanic artifacts, there's also a tendency to think big. Um, and so I decided I would go for two small ones. Now, the whistle, um, very, very commonplace piece of kit. I don't think that was actually standard issue um, aboard the ship. Officers had whistles, but this is a fairly um, cheap one that anybody could have. And the story is uh, behind this one that um, one of the boats that got away um, towards the end was one of the collapsibles. Um, these were not they, these were not as good as a regular lifeboat. They had to be fitted together and lowered from the davits. And um, this particular one, collapsible B, um, had hit the water and turned over. So you had about 20 men clinging desperately to the top of this, um, I'll call it a semi-lifeboat, um, getting wet, freezing. Um, and the, the big worry, of course, was they couldn't get anywhere themselves. They needed to attract attention. Uh, and the accounts vary, but uh, the, this whistle was given to a lady aboard lifeboat 12, one of the bigger lifeboats, who heard men blowing madly on a whistle and came back to investigate and found the men on collapsed B and took them off. So she, um, her, her name was Lillian Bentham, she put her coat onto a, one of the freezing uh, men that they brought aboard and he gave her that whistle by way of thanks and that's how it came into, well ultimately how it came into the museum's possession. And the reason I like it is because it it's such a tiny commonplace thing, but it just shows how even the smallest of things can have an effect, uh, uh, an, an impact out of all proportion to their size. Uh, in this case, on the lives of 20 men who might not otherwise have made it. And it's great to hear after that excerpt from the start that, you know, some people were able to go back and save some of the ones in the water. Let's move on to the, um, the pocket watch. 
Yes, this, this is a much sadder, uh, very, very poignant object. It was found on the body of a young man who was identified as uh, Robert Douglas Norman. So he was only 27 um, when the Titanic sank. Um, and the watch would have frozen very ra up very rapidly after it hit the water. And the time, the time is right. The, the Titanic um, actually sank uh, an hour before the time shown on the watch. But what we think happened is that of course, they'd entered the new time zone, and as many of us forget to do, he'd forgotten to adjust his watch for the fact that he was in a new time zone. Um, but that was uh, Robert Norman's uh, watch. He was traveling to the United States to visit his brother. And um, we know a fair bit about his final hours, thanks to another survivor, Miss Kate uh, Busts. Um, he accompanied her for a few hours uh, and he stayed with her until she was able to get a place in one of the boats. Um, but of course, women and children first being the rule it was, they were separated at that point despite her protests. Um, and he was not seen again until his body was recovered some time later. And there's just something awfully poignant about this. It's, it's an incredibly personal object, uh, a pocket watch. Um, and, and to me, it speaks not just for him, but for all the others who didn't make it off the ship at night. And how, how do you feel about, I mean, it feels like the Titanic clearly was a horrific tragedy, but it also brought attention to shipwrecks. I mean, it, 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 it cast the light, first of all, on radio and the ability of radio to help ships. And one of the reasons that it's unlikely, I guess, touch wood, that you would have a disaster like that now, is we do have radio and modern communications and GPA, you know, everyone knows where all the ships are, there's a satellite map, you can see where they all are. And this was perhaps the last biggest disaster. Um, just say something about how people react to it. I guess as a curator, you know, you watch people's reactions if they see these things exhibited. What's the fascination that people seem to be very drawn specifically to the Titanic? I think what draws people is, is, is two things. The first is the human story. We, we are very, very fascinated by how people act and behave uh, in times of stress or, or times of great catastrophe, because you get the whole um, gamut of behaviour from outright selflessness and heroism, you know, uh, um, people giving up spaces in lifeboats to those that they felt were more deserving, um, all the way through to uh, the opposite end. There, there was a young man who, to, to give him you know, credit where credit is due, was very young and absolutely terrified, but he got onto a life by putting a woman shawl on his head and, and just trying very hard not to be noticed. Uh, and everything in between. So it's, it's those human stories that attract people. Um, very feeling of both the best and the worst of yes humanity. yes and and if our and if our literature and 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 just about everything cultural we produce is anything to go by we, we we love exploring those stories because they speak to us in a very special way but the other thing is there's the um the, there's the nature of this particular disaster as well there's so much hubris about titanic she was such a marvelous creation she was um Without too much exaggeration, she was probably at the time the finest technological object that humanity could produce. And to have her sink like that is this terrible, terrible blow to our self-confidence. Uh, um, and, and, and it's reflected in, in the way that the disasters are reported. And you see this pattern with Captain as well. There's, there's an awful lot of sympathy um, for the bereaved. But at the same time, there's this really in-depth questioning and, and almost an anger about how could this possibly happen? You know, we, we're the most civilized and advanced society on earth. How could this possibly happen to us? Um, and, and it speaks of a certain insecurity. Um, and then lastly, there is that old element of pride cometh before a fall. Um, even if no one person or, 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 or factor is particularly to blame. Um, they, if you call something unsinkable, you're asking. <laughs> It was, it was, it was tempting fate, wasn't it? Okay, we have run out of time. We've run over time. Very, very quickly. I've got one question for both of you at the end here, which is, what is the, very quickly, uh, what is the most exciting thing that you would like to discover or be discovered underwater? Andrew, you can go first. Um, despite the best efforts of Paul Allen, the remaining Japanese aircraft carriers off Midway, I think the positions have been fixed by the, the, um, the, his survey ship, the Petrol. 
Uh, and although he himself is sadly no longer with us to see the results of, of that work, um, I'm hoping that those carriers will be able to explore, uh, be explored further. Brilliant. And Helen? Okay, so I have to go back into deep time and I think there is the potential for, for preservation of something earlier than 8,000 years old in terms of boats. So I'll go for anything earlier than that. I'd love to find it. That is a very straightforward request. I'm sure that shiny technology will get you there soon. Brilliant. Thank you both so very much. Um, it, there's so much to talk about. It's fabulous. Um, and we will be back next week with more museum objects, stories of the sea. Uh, do please talk to us. We're, we're, if you look for Royal Museums Greenwich on Facebook, Instagram or Twitter, you can suggest topics, ask questions uh, or just tell us, you know, how your day is. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, the exciting news is that the National Maritime Museum will open its doors from the 7th of September. So as with the other sites, you'll need to book ahead uh, RMG co.uk slash welcome back uh, entry is still free you just need to book a time online so some of the things Andrew's been talking about will be on display lastly all I need to do is to thank our fabulous contributors Andrew Chung and Helen Farr uh, thank you to Simon Kane for the reading to Steve Thompson for the music James Gill was the producer and I'm Helen Chersky and I'll see you next week <laughs>